This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. A few years ago, I visited NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I was there to speak at a conference, and afterward, I started wandering around. I found the NIST Museum, which is a cool visit, by the way. It's where they keep things like the resistor that served as the benchmark ohm in the late 19th century. And on my way out, I passed a display case in the lobby that was full of glass vials, front and center among them, a jar labeled Standard Reference Peanut Butter. I took a picture and posted it to Twitter, where it got a lot of interest. And then I became really intrigued by what turned out to be a very long list of standard reference materials formulated by the federal government. They include a lot of unlikely stuff, like urban dust, Lake Michigan fish tissue, and Lake Superior fish tissue, chlorinated pesticides, domestic sludge, bullets, New Jersey soil, organic contaminants from both smokers and non-smokers urine, whale blubber, fortified breakfast cereal, lead paint, yerba mate leaves, wheat kernels at varying levels of hardness, oil extracted from beach sand following the Deepwater Horizon spill, and of course peanut butter, complete with a material safety data sheet, noting that it is not a hazardous material. It turns out that NIST is a temple of sorts. It turns its eyes to the heavens and discerns the fundamental patterns of nature. It describes the primitive units, like the kilogram and the volt, and then it hands down practical definitions and derivations that industry can refer to as it goes about its business. The breadth of this reference material program says something about the breadth and complexity of the American manufacturing landscape, and that's always something that I love encountering. It says that there's a need for standards for all of these things, and that for each of these materials, there are a number of laboratories that specialize in them and businesses that depend on them. That's the subject of today's podcast episode, sort of the epistemology of measurement, how it happens and what it means for all of us. Before we get into the interview, though, I'd like to remind you that the Digital Factory Conference is coming up on May 7th. You'll want to be there to hear from people like the CEO of Spirit Aerosystems, which fabricates the fuselage of the Boeing 787, and the CEO of Align Technology, which is the largest user of 3D printing in the world, as well as the CIOs of FedEx and Baker Hughes, the CTO of GE, and the head of manufacturing at Ford. All of these people are going to be there to talk about their digital manufacturing strategies, how they're driving their entire businesses through the way they make their products. If you run manufacturing or if you're responsible for R&D or supply chain, you'll want to be in this room to think about how you can lead your business by making the right investments in manufacturing technology. Visit thedigitalfactory.com to learn more about the program, and when you register, use the code PODCAST for a discount. The Digital Factory is supported by Formlabs, which makes powerful, accessible 3D printers that scale from desktop prototyping into full production. My guest today is Stephen Chiquette. He's the director of the Office of Reference Materials at NIST. Steve, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you, John. Really looking forward to it. So you run this fascinating program that uh, produces reference materials ranging from iron, chromium, nickel, alloy to whale blubber. Tell us what this is about. Why is NIST producing these materials and how are they used? Yeah. So, you know, just to back up a little bit, you know, NIST is one of the oldest, is the oldest federal laboratory here. And it was essentially conceived or started to uh, address some um, some significant challenges in manufacturing, especially with uh, with respect to the railroad industry. So hmm. at the turn of the century, I mean, 19th century, uh, there were a bunch of railroad uh, derailments because um, inconsistency in, in the way the rails were being uh, alloyed or, hmm. or made. And so one of the very first standard products that 
the National Bureau of Standards at the time produced was uh, were metal alloys so that foundries could essentially check their composition of their materials against a standard. And that was that and amongst the limestone were, were really some of our first standard products. Hmm. And the idea is essentially for all areas of commerce is to provide a material that helps our stakeholders, our customers, uh, provide harmonization of methods and harmonization of, of materials. And that's that's really, it's been since our genesis, that's what we've been all about. So it, as you point out, it covers a huge range from what I would call our quote 20th century standards, mm -hmm. which would be our industrial based materials. So cements, um, things like, uh, you know, steel alloys, uh, ferrous alloys, non-ferrous alloys, things that support, you know, the real bricks and mortar type industries that, that have been traditional strengths for the U.S. economy. And now we're really starting to bridge out into what I'm hoping to not necessarily differentiate, but call our 21st century standard, mm -hmm. which are uh, we're getting very heavily and investing a lot into the whole bio area. My office essentially covers sort of the business side of this, but we also encourage research or try to do market research on, on the coming needs of, of some of the measurement standards that we would like to provide to industry. Um, so while we're still trying to support our, our brick and mortar industries, we're also looking very heavily into biopharma, biomanufacturing, and, and, uh, and again, the whole idea is to pr promote harmonization of methods and harmonization of results. And, and so how does a typical customer use something like a standard reference uh, stainless steel, let's say? Great, great question. We would provide a, a standard reference material that's then certified. So one of our alloys would be certified for its constituents, you know, so mm -hmm. the trace metals, but also the major, major metals and, and or major elements in, in that alloy. And so a foundry would say, let's say they're making an aluminum alloy, would be mixing their their concentration of you know, their, their big bucket, however that's done. But then they would take a subsample of that and measure it and try to make sure that it, it, it adhered to the formula that they had previously used. Well, they use different types of instrumentation to check that that concentration of those those individual elements, and they tend to be mass spectral methods or um, spark methods or laser based methods. Well, again, they want to make sure that their instrument that's doing the checking on their alloy formula alloy formula formulation, sorry, uh, is correct, and so they use a check standard or mm. a NIST standard reference material. Um, where they have confidence that we've done it right. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so they can check their results against ours and then correct for any bias in those results. And so it helps them just ensure that what they're making, um, what they're measuring is what they believe to be making. So the reference materials are used to calibrate further instruments sort of down the line. Correct. So we have kind of two flavors of of standard reference materials. So we have materials that are called primary calibrates, and those are traditionally used to calibrate the instrument itself. So for instance, you have a very sophisticated mass spectrometer or a um, NMR system or you know, whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. What we would provide is a, a primary calibration material that would allow you to, to create a calibration curve or somehow calibrate that instrument. But we also provide standard reference materials or reference materials that help you do method validation. Hmm. So for instance, uh, one of our common things that we sell for environmental measurements are, are standards that help calibrate systems for lead assaying. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I want to know how much lead is in this dust or in this paint. Well, I would use what we would call our, our primary calibration solution. It's essentially a solution of lead at a very well-known concentration in nitric acid. They would use that to calibrate their instrument, but that doesn't look anything like the sample that mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. they want to measure, correct, right? So then they would use another one of our uh, SRMs that would be where we've measured lead in a matrix. So that could be the lead content of orchard leaves, or it could be lead in paint, or mm. it could be lead in household dust. We have all of those types of reference materials. And those reference materials are then used to help them validate the methods that they use. So, you know, they're taking samples, you know, taking mm -hmm. paint, or they're uh, sampling, you know, uh, water coming out of a drinking fountain, and they want that reference material to look very much like the sample that they're measuring. Mm -hmm. And again, those types of reference materials are really used for, for method validation. 
And it really provides our customers and our stakeholders with the confidence that they're getting the right measurements. And that's really, I think, at the end of the day, what we're trying to help all of our our stakeholders is to have confidence in their measurements. A lot of our listeners might be familiar with NIST from the work that you're doing on the kilogram and redefining it. Right now, the kilogram is defined statutorily in terms of the mass of a few ingots uh, that are that are sitting in vaults, and and the kilogram is being redefined in terms of natural constants. Your program, though, is all about disseminating actual physical artifacts. So, how do you think about that? What what does that mean in the context of a of a world where we're trying to uh, redefine you know measures in terms of physical constants rather than artifacts? And how do you make sure that that there isn't some kind of systemic error at NIST that you're propagating by distributing these artifacts. Let me tease this out a little bit. You said, how do we know that we're right or there, we don't have bias? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's really an important point. Um, uh, and we do that through international intercomparisons. Hmm. And so the whole point of standardizing the seven SI units in terms of physical constants is that it allows essentially us to to make you know the physics side of our shop to make exquisitely exquisitely accurate and precise measurements of these physical constants, which then we declare that's the number, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Every every other national metrology institute of which NIST is there's only one in each each country uses that number. Now then it's up to the individual NMIs, national metrology institutes, to figure out a way to, how do we actually disseminate that to our customers? So if, for instance, uh, for the kilogram, you know, if I'm talking to the local grocery store guy and saying, calibrate my balance, I'm, I'm not going to refer him to Planck's constant. Uh-huh, okay? uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> right? So we do that through, how do we disseminate that measurement service? You know, so we've got this, 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 this ideal Planck's constant or Boltzmann's uh, constant, uh-huh, you know, that, uh-huh. that helps define volts, current, uh, light, weight, and stuff. And that that's great at the international level where we can spend, you know, and, and you probably know this better than I, but, you know, we spent almost 20 years trying to redefine the kilogram, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's a lot of, lot of discussions between all the NMIs on, on what that number is going to be. But it, then it's up to us to, to realize that for our stakeholders and our customers. Um, and we do that through a number of other measurement services. So it's either a calibration service, of which there's a, a large component at NIST, standard reference materials, in which what we do is we say, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't help the person who's trying to measure lead and water to, to make sure his school's drinking water is, mm-hmm. is mm-hmm limits is somehow traceable to the mole. You know, I mean, you know, Avogadro's number. Right. But we take care of that internally. So we assert and we provide a tra- what's called a traceability path saying, here's the path back to that fundamental constant. You guys don't need to worry about that. We're dealing with that on the international scale, but here's how we're going to disseminate that measurement in a meaningful way to you. And that's either through a calibration service, through, you know, we're, we'll take your widget, we'll calibrate it, we'll give you back with the mm-hmm. report saying oh, the volts are, you know, it's the right, right voltage setting, it's the right current measurement. Um, we don't do that so much for chemistry because mm-hmm. um, I don't want to denigrate my calibration services guys, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, measuring voltage is you're measuring one thing, you have one, two terminals. You know? Right, right. It's, it is hard. It's, it's, it's really difficult to do, but, but in chemistry and biology, you know, we have the universe of, of matrices, we have the universe of analytes. And so we have to do that in a little bit different fashion, but ultimately how we try to at least tease out these biases, how do we know that the gallon we're measuring or that the lead concentration we're measuring in water is the same as our partners in Europe? And that's, again, harmonization of these measurements is, is really important. And we do that through international intercomparisons. So this is all about translation then. This is you, you guys are standing sort of between these extremely fundamental low level definitions of, uh, of measurements and you're making them available through something that's concrete uh, and easy to sort of compare to industrial standards. Yes, that's right. E- easier to use for our stakeholders um, and it makes it look much, much more like what they're actually doing. So one kind of assumption that comes to mind when you look at, uh, you know, a, a NIST certified uh, standard reference material is that it might be kind of the platonic ideal of, let's say, uh, peanut butter 
or fortified breakfast cereal, that, uh, that this is like lab produced ultra pure peanut butter. Is that the case or is it actually just highly representative uh, peanut butter or fortified breakfast cereal or whatever? That, that's a super great question. Um, so in certain certain of our reference materials, absolutely. We will uh, either on contract have it custom made for us. Um, and it is a it, kind of the utopian ideal of what that material should look like. In the cases of our dietary supplements or our food products like peanut butter or uh, as you mentioned, some of the gilcoboa, you know, echinacea mm-hmm. type SRMs or reference controls you have. No, those are in fact collected. Well, let me back up and just say we have a huge, huge collaboration and program uh, with the Infant Nutritional Formula Manufacturers Association. Mm -hmm. And they're providing us with actual off the shelf material. It looks exactly, it in fact is produced exactly in the same fashion. Hmm. So the peanut butter is peanut butter, spam is spam, or, Uh or, you know, (laughs) it's no different. It's just a lot more expensive, but (laughs) right, right. It is exactly the same. For those kind of products, it's exactly the same as what the consumer would be using. And that's really important for the testing laboratories because, um, you know, if we were to produce something that, you know, was easier for us to measure, that's really not helping our stakeholders and our customers. They, you know, they've got to, they have to, to assert, you know, when they put a label on, on their meat homogenates or, or their peanut butter, that here's the level of protein, here's the level of these, you know, critical vitamins, potassium, sodium, mm-hmm. whatnot. Honestly, we don't have any expertise in making peanut butter. So, you know, it's really incumbent upon us to, to provide them with a sample or a matrix that looks looks or is exactly like what they're using. It's a complex world and they have to measure it. And so you have to give them standard references that uh, reflect that. Correct. Absolutely. How different does uh, your instrumentation look than uh, what you would find in an industrial lab for any of these materials? Are you using instrumentation that's two orders of magnitude more expensive and more sophisticated or, or is it the method at the heart of it that's really salient? So, you know, that's a great, another great question. When I first came here, hundred years ago, you know, a long, long, long time ago, 1986. Absolutely. We were building our own instruments. Um, and our, you know, our, our mantra back then was that we wanted to be 10 times better than anything that was commercially available. And I think we're still doing that for some of our uber sophisticated physics experiments, uh, you know, Bose-Einstein condensates and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But for analytical measurements, no, we're in fact using state-of-the-art but commercially available equipment. And it turns out in the you know 30 years I've been here that mass specs, NMRs, all, all the analytical equipment that's being used out in the, the real world and the, you know, the commercial world um, is what we use. Um, where we bring value added to that is that we would use methods that are far more laborious and detailed and excruciatingly uh, precise than our commercial customers would use. They've got to, you know, they can make measurements quickly, accurately, and precisely, um, and they can't, they can't nist it to death. So there's, (laughs) there's where we, there's where we add our value added. We nist it to death um, and provide the reference material often measured on the same instruments that they would be using Mm -hmm but we'll use primary methods of analysis. So it might be spiking in an isotope, you know, to provide an internal reference. So really expensive to do, really time consuming and labor intensive, but it gives us the answers and it gives us the accuracy that we need to confer, you know, um, with high confidence, a value on that certificate, you know, that in this peanut butter is this amount of, of um, fatty acid and, mm-hmm. and then, our customers would use the same instrumentation, but not necessarily the same method um, and compare it to our results so that they could get method validation. And again, once again, confidence in their results. And I think that that, again, is really what we're trying to provide. What kinds of changes have you seen in the way that your industry partners uh, work in the time that you've been at NIST? Has the instrumentation changed enough that they've really been able to upgrade what they do on their end? Uh, has, has a cultural change happened in the way that they feel about the precision of their of their work? The biggest change that I've seen, it is what it is. I mean, it is that when I first started at NIST, most of the people, I, most of my stakeholders that I was talk, were talking to were PhD analytical chemists, you know, mm-hmm. published, mm-hmm. Um, 
peers, you know, people like me. And now uh, in a lot of companies, especially in the emerging industries like the cannabis industry, you know, dietary supplements, um, hugely important industries for, for us to provide, again, measurement assurance, you mm -hmm. know, we, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of those folks that are doing the, are at the bench doing the analytical measurements are, um, are, you know, BS level chemists, uh, sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes not. So, mm -hmm. so that, that difference in kind of training level, um, and again, they're, they're responding to the, the economic needs of the company. They need to be able to make measurements. They need to be able to make them accurately more, more to probably in a you know, case of cannabis or the dietary supplements industry would be to respond to uh, regulatory uh, demands. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing, but also I think at least my, it's my impression that, that now there's a lot more pressure on companies um, and, and consequently on us to get out reference materials that are matrix specific or uh, um, that help validate methods in a much quicker turnaround time. So mm -hmm. past we've had, you know, honestly, our average for producing an SRM because we want to get it right mm -hmm. is on the order of five or six years. Oh, and, wow. You know, and we really just can't follow that model anymore. Um, so we're really trying to, implement changes so that we can be much more responsive to, to our customers and to our stakeholders um, and provide them again with, with meaningful reference materials, but in a much shorter time frame. So, so yeah, it, it has changed quite a bit. Um, I, I'd say. That change in kind of level of experience resonates with uh, some of the areas we often talk about on this podcast, more related to manufacturing, um, which has become more accessible to a broader range of people in the last few years as it's kind of digitized as certain things have become commoditized. And so that's something you often hear, um, in, uh, in other parts of industry that, you know, your, your partners always used to be professional, uh, engineers with a specific background in some field who have worked for a big industrial company for 30 years and have this kind of approach to it. And now you have, you know, bachelor's level or, or perhaps even kind of autodidacts who have taught themselves right. how to do some kind of say industrial automation or, or a new fabrication process or something like that. So it's, uh, that's, that's really interesting. That's something you see all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So tell us a little bit about the process for developing a new reference material. Uh, you mentioned it takes uh, five to six years sometimes, but how, how do you enter that pipeline? Do you have a, a list of uh, the materials that you think you ought to produce, a list of the materials that industry requests? How do you put in a request for, for a new SRM? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so uh, it's it's a little all over the, the map. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of different ways, but essentially it is, it's, it's marketing, you know, and it is, we attend conferences and that's where essentially, um, you know, we have a very, very deep technical base here at NIST is, is in bio and chemistry and in the physics side. And most of our technical champions for producing these reference materials are attending conferences. They're in stakeholder groups. We interact with the FDA uh, and USDA constantly, um, our other government partners. Um, and yeah, we're, we're kind of keeping our ear to the ground as well. And you kind of know, you know, something's coming up the pipeline that, you know, mm -hmm. we should be either trying to develop expertise in a particular area or start holding workshops or, or attend workshops to try to find out, okay, what, what's really going to be the next thing that we should be investing in. Um, so there's, yeah, how do you get it going? Well, there's, it's really helpful for us. And I love this when, when we get an industry group, writes us a letter and say, hey, NIST, you know, we need, we need this for this purpose. And for us, that's, that's really kind of really good validation because our challenge is that, as I said, it's, it, it takes four to five years or, or, or longer to produce an SRM. We really can't afford the time or the money sink into mm -hmm. producing something that, you know, maybe the coolest thing since sliced bread, but nobody wants or right. needs. Right? right. And that's our biggest challenge. Um, and actually, it's not unique to just us. I, we have a number of uh, partners, what, what I would call secondary standards producers, um, big, big companies. Mm -hmm. And this is really one of the challenge. I mean, you'll get a lot of people that are very passionate saying we need a reference material in this particular area. Well, if you go off and you produce something and it doesn't look exactly right, it sits on your shelf. And now you, you know, maybe the researchers got some nice papers and some nice talks on it, but that mm -hmm. really doesn't 
ultimately impact our stakeholders, which are the U.S. taxpayer. You know, I mean, yeah. honestly, we've got to be we've got to be helping them out. So, so we do. We kind of have this ad hoc method for doing marketing. Um, we get industry input. We get other government agency input. Uh, international input uh, mm-hmm. because we are the leader in the world in producing reference materials. That may change, but we're we're trying to stay on top of that uh, heap. So it's usually currently um, it's very organic and and it's what I would consider from the bottom up. You know, it's mm-hmm. from our our technical champions who are the experts in the areas that are saying to us, "Hey, we need to invest in this." Um, and it's really my job and this job. We don't want to necessarily have a top-down approach, but we've got to start learning to get better at assessing business cases for some of these things. And that's where we're, we're, we've got some really nice interactions with some external partners that, that produce reference materials that are kind of helping us out with that because – Frankly, we're all scientists, and none of us were trained to be businessmen. So, what's in the what's in the pipeline? what What are you uh, What are you working on currently in the way of uh, you know materials that are uh, in process? So, I think the most exciting one. Well, the, there's a lot of exciting ones, um, and we're still responding, of course, to environmental, to greenhouse gas type uh, measurement uh, assurance products. Um, but a big area that that we're being involved in right now, or starting to to generate. Uh, a lot of investment in both the research side, which will eventually, you know, for us, we hope we're not doing research just for research purposes here. Our ultimate goal is to provide a measurement service to our community. You know, mm-hmm. that's that. So it's better science, better methods, better standards, better calibrations. Um, but is this trying to impact this whole area of biomanufacturing? Hmm. Um, so uh, it's kind of a very non traditional thing for NIST to be doing. But on the other hand, in a sense, you know, I come from the analytical chemistry division. We're kind of a blue collar science, you know, Mm -hmm. tell us where the problems are. And (laughs) we're kind of agnostic to to that. You're measuring stuff and stuff, you know, Uh whether it's uh blood or or a steel. So, but we've just in the last, well, last two years now have produced a reference material that's a monoclonal antibody. Hmm. And it's the most highly characterized protein biologic in the world. Hmm. Um, And It was done by a lot of work at NIST, but also a lot of uh, collaborators, again, internationally, but but nationally, a lot of input from the pharma industry, um, from the manufacturer, you know, from the instrument manufacturers um, Mm -hmm. and FDA. And it is within, you know, less than two years of being on our shelves, per se, Mm -hmm. is one of our top sellers. So, you know, monoclonal antibodies are produced in CHO cells. Cho cells or different types of cells by fermentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the monoclonal antibody that that we're using as a reference material is, is again, highly characterized. But what would be really useful for the biopharma and the biomanufacturing uh, groups to be able to have a cell, a Cho cell, that produces the NIST monoclonal antibody so they can look at the effects on structure, function, and activity of a molecule that can be, again, you can look at the original NIST monoclonal antibody and compare mm-hmm. your results of your process on this CHO cell as it's producing the NIST monoclonal antibody and look at both up, up, upstream and downstream effects on, on, the, on, the, um, huh. on that particular molecule. So we think that that's just in its infancy right now, um, and it's going to get us into this whole concept of uh, which is crazy to even be saying it. Maybe is there such a thing as a standard cell? We're not sure. We've got you know very important and interesting, I think, uh, research areas in in engineering biology right now. Bio is going to be the 21st century economy. So, again, looking at trying to to provide materials that help uh, harmonization of measurement results across different platforms. And right. That could be. A voltmeter, or it could be a biofermenter. You know, right, so right, right. I think the biological products are are really going to be exciting um, and highly impactful. So we've got different monoclonal antibodies that are going to be eventually come out. Um, we're also I'm hoping this year. Uh, uh, one of the 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 big issues with with uh, protein biologics, um, and this is really not my area, but I'll talk about it. <laughs> You know, I do this all the it, time. Yeah. yeah, right. Is the um, is this whole concept of biosimilars? You know, the mm-hmm. 
the, 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 the originator molecule, as you know, are really expensive to produce, take a lot of you know, intellectual property to make you know, a, mm -hmm. a protein biologic that's specific and, and impacts a, a particular disease. And you know, both Europe and the U.S. would love to be able to say, you know, after the, the, original, the originator has exercised their patent rights and, and that's, uh, that's expired, that they would love to create this whole generic market, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. they're called biosimilars. It's a huge and incredibly difficult problem because, you know, small molecules that cure asthma or something like that are easy to chemically synthesize. Mm -hmm. Protein mm -hmm. biologics, which might have molecular weights of upwards of 150,000, have all sorts of different structural characteristics that aren't necessarily present in small molecules that impact the efficacy of treatment. Mm -hmm. And and so it's hugely important, especially because these are drugs are are, are uh, not orally taken, but injected right into your bloodstream, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that both the secondary and tertiary structures are are the same, and the glycosylation, so the the sugars that get attached to the proteins post translation are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge measurement science challenge for everyone. I mean, there really are no good ways of doing it. So one of the materials that we'll be coming out with very soon is essentially 12, 12 to 15 pure glycans that would be in solution. So it, it, again, it's mm. kind of tearing it down to the primary calibration thing saying, all right, we know our monoclonal antibody A has this glycosylation pattern and it's got these particular glycans on it. That's hard enough to figure out. We're going to provide them with solutions of pure materials that will enable them to quantitate what's present. And then eventually we hope through advanced measurement techniques to actually locate them mm -hmm. on, on the molecule. But, but we're taking baby steps right now. So um, so the biologics, I think, are, are where we're trying to kind of steer the ship a little bit. You know, it's a big, the SRM portfolio is, is big uh, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, 1,200 materials. Um, and it's, like you said, classically based in what I would consider our 20th century economy. But we're really trying to make investments in the new bioeconomy things and try to anticipate both in the biomanufacturing segments and the health and clinical segments of, of where we'd like to be where we think the industry needs to be in 10, 10 to 15 years. Let me see if I can sort of characterize some of the technical challenge that you just mentioned, because I think it, it's really significant that in a lot of kind of uh, analytical chemistry and indeed in the conventional pharmaceutical industry, what you're characterizing is a molecule of some sort that's the resulting molecule in the product, whereas in these modern biology fields, you're characterizing processes, right? And, and a cell that that synthesizes something and so you, there's a deeper characterization problem is that kind of the the gist yeah that's that's correct right it, and it's just it's so much more complicated because again these proteins are so much bigger you know molecular mm -hmm. weight um and the activity uh and the efficacy of that product for again curing a disease state are based on not just chemical reactions, but how it physically interacts. You know, these molecules aren't what we consider pure. I mean, they're not homogeneous. There mm -hmm. can be a diversity of, of the, the the glycosylation pattern, for instance, or the charge charges on these particular molecules. And so, so yeah, so it is. You're you're growing them in living systems. Um, what you're feeding them makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. They're not alive. You know, they're not alive when they're a medicine. But, but it's that whole upstream process of making these things that impacts ultimately what you get in the end. Right. 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 We're trying to develop ways to characterize that or help characterize that all the way through the pipeline. So I want to come back to, to something you've mentioned a couple of times, uh, which is the international community of uh, metrology institutes. Right. How do you work with the other international metrology institutes when you when you come up with a standard of some sort? Yeah, no, that's a, another really great point. Actually, it's a really cogent point so, uh -huh. because we're wrestling with that right now. Again, kind of amazing history. This all started with Napoleon, you know, and um, essentially they were trying to say, you know, a gallon should be a gallon, a meter should be a meter. Mm -hmm. And so there was a treaty organization created in Paris um, and in the late, I think, 1700s or mm -hmm. early 1800s. It's the Treaty of the Meter, you know, and so that's essentially morphed into um, the whole uh, what we call the CIPM, it's the it's in French, but it's the mm -hmm. International Weights and Measures Treaty C Convention, and that's where all the again all the seven units of the SI, you know, length, mm -hmm. voltage, current, and now mass, uh, you know, which is mm -hmm. where chemistry 
and two, um, where all the NMIs essentially gather in trade notes. Mm -hmm. um, for us, it's a little bit different than than voltage or length or speed of light. So in the CCQM, that's the Consultative Committee for Quantitation of Mass, but it's mm -hmm. in French. We have a bunch of different working groups, and they cover essentially the me and again it's all part of harmonization of measurements and so essentially what the the most mature portion of that is the organic analytical working group it's the and that's where uh, essentially NMIs um, we make certain measurement claims mm -hmm. and we want to sure that our trading partners through this this treaty organization that's recognized by this treaty organization is that we have mutual claims and that they can be verified you know ultimately our, our customers want to know that if i buy a standard um from the lab of the government chemist lgc and mm -hmm. in, in the uk are what they are asserting at the lead level in their water sample is that really translatable to what we would measure in the united states mm -hmm. so we, we validate those claims in these working groups by holding essentially international inner comparisons of our capacity to make these kinds of measurements huh. and so those are assessed um, and so it's it's kind of a, sort of fun, but it's very challenging in the sense that um, one lab will agree to let's say we're going to send out a blind study, mm -hmm. and it can't be a reference material that we produce. And you know, it's and everyone of course agrees that it it should be um, you know it's what the matrix is going to be, what the analyte is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but then essentially the NMIs get together, they do those key comparison measurements, they compile the results, and then we intercompare, see how each everyone did against each other's results. And that's how we ensure we catch, you know, if there are lapses of expertise, which is really challenging for, you know, if you've been doing something for 30 years, people retire, you know, uh -huh, and uh -huh. it's really, really kind of important that we continue to do this effort, but it's very time consuming and it's really expensive. And so we're really struggling with that, especially um, as our portfolio grows, mm -hmm. how do you, continue to make new products, but then continue to essentially demonstrate either to the world or to yourself or to your stakeholders that you still have the competence and the capacity to make those measurements and that they're intercomparable with the other National Metrology Institute. It has this interesting kind of aspect of like political philosophy almost, um, where there's kind of a, a hierarchy of standards. And, you know, maybe if I buy a $4 uh, ruler somewhere that that has been compared to, you know, a medium standard, and then uh, the ruler manufacturer owns a, a pretty good standard, and that that is periodically compared to a very good standard, and then that's compared to the NIST standard. But then at the top, uh, it's just NIST and a handful of other national institutes that are basically checking each other's work as peers, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, how, how many national... Uh, uh, metrology labs are there? Does does every country have one? Is that very important to them, or do some countries just adopt the work of the of the group? Well, really important question. Yeah, it, pretty much any country that does international trade mm -hmm. has a national metrology institute. Now, whether or not they produce reference materials, that they may have certain areas of expertise. So, for instance, um, in Mexico or in some of the uh, South American countries, they may choose to focus on things that are only really important to their economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they wouldn't have necessarily the full gamut of measurement capabilities that the U.S. would have or some of our European counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, and it also depends on really what their governments are willing to invest. As you can imagine, it's, it's a very expensive enterprise to be doing. And mm -hmm. um, I would say almost every country in the world has one. Uh, they just have different capacities. I want to come back to one other thing uh, that that you mentioned earlier that uh, that there's demand uh, in kind of your your uh, new product development for standards related to the cannabis industry, and that that must right. be sort of tricky as a as a government agency um, that uh, cannabis is still illegal under federal law, though it's becoming legal under under state law. How do you um, wh what does your sort of cannabis product lineup look like now? Well, we have uh, yeah, sadly we have none, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, and and again, that's kind of a manpower issue on our end. Um, but we see, or at least I see, that there's going to be incredible demand, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you look at California. You know, California has mm -hmm. enacted, I think it's like 48 pages of regulations re with related to essentially distribution. You know, again, quality and measurement assurance of both potency, but 
heavy metal uh, residues, pesticides, um, things that can cause significant potentially health threats down to the sampling and, and, and other, other things. So you're right. It is, I think it's a challenge. Um, our challenge is not so much from federal regulations. I, I believe it's, it's really, we've got, we're kind of spread way too thin uh-huh. <laughs> on a number of our other things, but it's, it's clearly going to be a growth industry and one in which I think right now you're seeing a lot of the instrument companies, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, getting involved in producing, um, which is good. I mean, they're really taking the lead on producing valid methods for doing, you know, for doing accurate and, and accurate analysis. So at least there's comparability of results. And there are other commercial standards labs, secondary mm-hmm. standards producers are trying to address that market. But, you know, in the sense, we can kind of support things, you know, like pesticide residues, for instance, we do have SRMs that have, you know, pesticide concentrations on orchard leaves or apple leaves or pear leaves. Mm-hmm. Comparable substances may, you know, different matrices a, a little bit, but um, so, yeah, I would, I would like us to get it uh, more involved in that. Um, it, but it's just, we'd really just kind of have a bandwidth limit yeah. in, in our own chem- chemistry capabilities. So it's right now, I think in it, not in the cannabis area, but we're partnering with the FDA on, on supporting materials that might be used to support future legislation on constituents in tobacco smoke or tobacco mm-hmm. vaping, you know, mm-hmm. e-vaping mm-hmm. type things there. We don't have to worry about, I mean, of course it's regulated, but there's, it's not illegal to use. The cannabis industry is just fascinating in that it has been a large industry for a long time, but is only recently a legitimate industry with, uh, right. with the capacity to do the kind of sophisticated, uh, measurement characterization and sort of response to regulation and so on that, that you're describing. So it's, it's basically got to come out of nowhere in a, in the course of just a few years. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it's, it, I think a lot of people are seeing it as a, as a huge growth uh, industry and, and especially if, if there's, you know, international trade, let's say we, you know, we have trading partners with Canada or Mexico that are going to be um, essentially passing their area, you know, exporting or importing our products or exporting their products to our country, there's going to have to be, you know, essentially they'll, they'll need to meet uh, regulatory and environmental regulations to, mm-hmm. to send those materials here. Stephen, I'd like to move on to the, uh, the question I ask every guest on this program, and I bet you've got a really interesting answer. What's your favorite tool? It's such an interesting question. I almost had a panic attack trying to think, <laughs> think about that last night, but I have to be really honest. So I've been out of the lab for a while. Mm-hmm. So my favorite tool is called a curry comb. It's, huh. I, I ride horses and I ride three or four times a week. And so my favorite tool is basically, uh, and it's just the way I kind of morph from a business day back, you know, into real life. Uh-huh. It, you're brushing your horse with this curry comb and it's just, it's, it's just, that's my favorite tool. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is a curry comb? What is it? How does it, how does it work? Well, so basically, especially now it knocks all the mud off your horse. So uh-huh, we got, uh-huh. you know, you're basically, you're grooming your horse with these things and it, uh, it's just, it's very relaxing for me. I hope it is for the horse, but, uh, but it, it's, um, it's essentially to, to clean their coats and to, to, yeah, get all the dirt and mud off and, and, uh, distribute the oils around the coat uh-huh. and just make them healthier. In my former life, the, the, uh, when I was doing optical spectroscopy, uh, my favorite toy, uh, which wasn't very sophisticated, I loved drilling and tapping quarter 20 bolts and holes. You know, uh-huh. I don't know. Uh-huh. You know we're, we're always making something. So tap and dies were, were my favorite. You yeah, know? And, and you did it manually with a, with a, a jig on a, on a bench top? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Well, drill press and a jig, right, uh-huh, right. Uh-huh. But we used to kid and laser it would, when I was doing spectroscopy a long time ago. Pieces of aluminum, duct tape, and uh, and bubble gum were about you know that that was how we put together optical setups. Right, right, right. I've heard a related joke that when you got a PhD in physics, it's really just training and plumbing that yeah, you're uh, you're exactly. doing nothing but kind of like maintaining big ducts and uh, keeping yeah. things aligned. Absolutely right, because the lasers I was using when I first came to NIST were all water cooled, and that was constantly the source of our problems mm-hmm. was dealing with plumbing problems. Right, you got water all over the floor, which is not a good thing when you've got you know 40 volts and 100 amps at three phase power. <laughs> <laughs> you really right, don't right. want uh, floods. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Excellent. Well, Stephen, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. If 
if listeners want to find uh, your office and the work that you're doing at NIST, where should they look? www.nist.gov slash SRM. Stephen Triquette, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been great talking today. Oh, thank you for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. If you'd like to learn more about standard reference materials and this program at NIST, you can find relevant links in the show notes for this episode, which are at thedigitalfactory.com. And when you visit thedigitalfactory.com, you'll also, of course, find details about the Digital Factory Conference coming up on May 7 in Boston, where you'll hear from leaders who are transforming their businesses through digital manufacturing. When you register for the Digital Factory Conference, use the code PODCAST for a discount. The Digital Factory is supported by Formlabs, which makes powerful, accessible 3D printers that scale from desktop prototyping into full production. For the Digital Factory Podcast, I'm John Bruner.